Good evening and welcome to the West Shore Photography Club. This is our every other Monday night uh, meeting. This is uh, the date is what? The 6th of February and welcome to the meeting tonight. We're gonna have a session on plugins and what the role of them is, when to use them and lots of samples of images from various and sundry plugins. But before we get to that, I want to mention that today our membership has grown to 137 members, and that is our all time. Is that our all time high, Dennis? Yes, that is. Okay, yes. that's great. And uh, and most of them are coming from local around the community too. Okay, there's some that are far away, but um, most of them are coming from around here, which is great. And thanks to all of you for promoting the West Shore Photography Club when you're out and about. We really appreciate that. Our next meeting is going to be on February the 20th. And on that meeting, we're going to have a, a theme of working the scene, and we're going to talk about uh, how you some tips and tricks on how you might want to consider working the uh, the uh, scene. We had a good trip on Saturday to the uh, Rustburg Railroad. Norbert, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you give us a? Uh, a yeah, we had a work? we had a good turnout. Great, great weather. Uh, we had a great opportunities for a lot of shooting and. Uh, yeah, I was I was very impressed. I hope everyone else had enjoyed it as much as I did. It, uh, there was a lot lot to shoot there. It really was great, great outing. Great. Did you get any of the steam shots coming out of the uh, the uh, trains? Well, there was some. There was some, but actually the weather wasn't quite cold enough to really make it really prominent. Uh, you know? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Norbert. Sure. Uh, this com this coming uh, Saturday we have a trip to the Lebanon Valley Art College. Uh, I mean, Lebanon Valley uh, College at the art gallery there. Uh, Mike, uh, can you give a, a little bit of an update on that, please? Yeah, the um, this coming Saturday at Lebanon Valley, there's a show of photographs by Edward Weston and Tina Madotti. And there are some others as well. Um, there's some, at least one, and maybe more of uh, Cartier-Bresson. So if you'd like to see some of the classics uh, and plus a spicy story, <laughs> that's, um, that's a good place to do it. Tina Madotti, and I'll use this phrase at Lebanon Valley as well, Tina Madotti was a hottie. And um, <laughs> Edward Weston thought so too. So it's, it's quite a story of their years in Mexico the work they did there was was tremendous, um, and Mexico City was a hotbed for art right after the uh, Mexican Revolution. So those are the photographs you'll see are the actual photographs by Madotti and Edward Weston and some others as well. It's nice to see the the classics for real and not just in a book and so on. So. Um, Joe, I can't remember exactly what time we need to be there. 11 o'clock. Uh, okay. 11. So be there at 11 and uh, should be good. Yeah. Dr. McNulty, she's the director of the art gallery. She called today, just wanted to confirm that we're going to be there. And, uh, and I told her that you were going to be uh, leading the trip and talking. And she said, oh, great. I can't wait to hear him because I love to hear Mike talk. He knows all about that stuff, you know. So <laughs> great. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. You're Maybe welcome. You Maybe she'll yeah. give him an honorary degree. She might, yeah, or he could not, or cash. You want? I know you want the degree, not the, not the cash, Mike. So uh, we have uh, coming up a trip uh, in a couple of weeks on the 18th to a the historical model train society in Mechanicsburg, and um, you can read about it in the email announcement to come out. But it's it's it will be a very worthwhile trip. We have. Uh, limiting limiting to 20 people because of the size and the space so we have lots of room so get us an email uh, if you want to be put onto the list and that'll be a lot of fun and then on March 11th we have a trip to the Amish country for what they call a mud sale and a mud sale is really like a flea market that the Amish uh, and the Mennonites have and uh, they call it a mud sale because it's in a big field and it's usually kind of damp and moist and it's a lot of mud there. And this is one where you can photograph 
the the Amish and the Mennonites, and they don't give you a hard time. And uh, and it's really cool because there's lots of kids there, and they're playing, and the parents let them go, and they you know you can photograph them. It's it's really cool. We have that coming up on the 11th of March. So, and um, that is it for right now. Anything from the members for the good of the order? Any ex exhibits or places that you know of that we should be going to? Um, I have I have one more to add to the possibility mix. Okay. Um, I was at the auto show uh, a week or two ago, and I was talking to a gentleman who actually is in charge of the, um, let's see, not uh, Rolls Royce Club. There's a Rolls Royce Club in Mechanicsburg. Yes. And I was and I was telling him about our lovely little club. And then we got to thinking like it might be kind of a neat operation to ha have that. They've got a club. I, I forget the exact location, but it's somewhere with a Mechanicsburg address. And they would love to have the club, you know, come over similar to what the, the train uh, model railroad uh, event is. So something to put on the radar. I, I kept his business card, but if, if interested, we could pursue that later. But I, that seemed kind of fascinating to get some old, old classic Rolls Royce to uh, photograph. Great. Thanks. We have a meeting coming up with the trips committee. So we'll put that in the hat. David Stauffer and myself and a couple other people were over to that. I'm going to say it's been about six years ago and very nice. But if you have more than 20 people, I think it'll be crowded. But somebody okay. can go check it out in Mechanicsburg. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dick. Anything else for anybody from anybody? Okay. Well, then uh, we will get started. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about plugins. I want to let you know that this is not an, an instructional thing. We're not going to teach you or try and teach you what is and how you use and excuse me, how you actually run the software to make it happen. There are a gazillion plugins for software for like your base programs, like let's say you're using on one or capture one or Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever program you're using. There's a lot of third party plugins for that. So we are not going to be doing an instructional, but more of a capabilities. And we're going to have lots of samples for that. And be, we'll entertain lots of questions as we go along. So let me get started here and bring up my PDF. Oh, don't tell me I didn't put it in here. Joe Farrell, could you do that? <laughs> um, let me see. I, what did I do? Here we go. No, 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 I got the wrong one. Gosh. Dennis, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, can you um, start off with sure can until I get my PDF up and running? Yes, sure can. Thank Let you. me start off by uh, welcoming some members we have from the Frederick uh, Camera Click. So welcome, guys. And let me also take a minute to uh, thank Joe for filling in. Uh, as many of you know, I like to travel, and uh, so does Joe. Unfortunately, we don't seem to travel at the same time. So I want to extend my sincere thanks to Joe for filling in and, and covering meetings when I'm away. My, if you follow me on Facebook, you know that my wife and I were in the Caribbean for 14 days celebrating our 52nd wedding anniversary. So uh, in times like this, when we travel, uh, Joe steps in, takes over with the emails, hosts the meetings, and does all those kind of things to keep things running very smoothly. So thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. And I'm sure the members do too. Let me share my screen. And we'll get started with uh, a plugin called SnapArt. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes. Any, any, okay, very good. Yeah, I'm never sure because I can't tell. Okay, there's a, a, a program uh, called SnapArt for that I've been using for, oh, maybe 12 years. Uh, it's simple to use. Uh, it does some interesting things, which I'm going to show you. And uh, it is now uh, being handled by a company called Exposure Software. And uh, I have a link in this PowerPoint presentation. I will have this available for you to download tomorrow uh, as part of the follow-up email that we send out. And it'll take you right to the software if you want to check it out. Okay. Uh, SnapArt 4, you can uh, do a 30-day trial if you, you want to see what, how it works. 
uh, before you decide whether you want to buy or not. Uh, you can buy it as part of a bigger package, but if you're just interested in SnapArt 4, uh, then it's, it's $79. Now, the interesting thing is that if you don't have Lightroom or don't want to run it as a plugin, but you like what it does, you can purchase it and just run it as a standalone program. Okay? If you're using Lightroom or some other you know, program as your base, then you can uh, install it as a plugin and it runs smoothly you know, from that other program. Uh, the folks at Exposure, uh, uh, it, uh, Exposure Software did a great job of, with a little uh, promo. So uh, I hope this works, but I thought I'd show you this. It's only like a minute and 20 seconds. Show you this little promo video that they do. Uh, and then I'll get into showing, showing you some examples uh, that I have done myself. So let's take a minute and 20 seconds to uh, look at this video. Very good. I thought they did a nice job with that brief intro, so I thought you would uh, enjoy that to start out. And uh, there'll be a link. You can, you can watch it again if you want when you get the download the PDF. Uh, I, the reason I use it is I sometimes tire of the documentary look, the harshness of digital photographs. Uh, and I want I, I admire painting effects, and I tried painting in Photoshop, and I'm just no good at it, haven't developed that technique yet. But this simulates uh, many different effects, uh, and it's done very easily. So I use this as to my shortcut, as my shortcut until I learn how to do some of those more creative effects. But it does take a rather mundane looking documentary type photo, and uh, I think spice it up a little bit. Now, I completely understand that not everybody is, is into that or there may be a lot of the effects you'll see here that you don't like, but hopefully there are one or two that, that will appeal to you. But the uh, flexibility of the program uh, is very impressive. Uh, one of the things you should know, uh, on, as in, indicated in this slide, is that the images that go to SnapArt have to be uh, in a JPEG format. So if you're shooting uh, as a raw uh, or TIFF image, then uh, you can, if you're, and, and I'm assuming you're using Lightroom here in this comment, you can simply go into the preferences in Lightroom. Okay, open Lightroom, go up to edit, go down to preferences, and this uh, 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 screen opens, this interface. So you can add, as I have done here, uh, the first add one ext under external editing, the first plugin I have is Photoshop. <laughs> and for you traditionalists, you may not think of Photoshop as a plugin, but when you use a workflow like I do, Lightroom is my base. I work primarily from Lightroom, go to other programs and come back, bring my images back to Lightroom. So indeed, for me, Photoshop is simply a plugin that is subservient to, to Lightroom. Uh, and SnapArt is also a plugin as I use it, and I install or have it listed here. And I indicated in file format that I want the images to come through as, as uh, to go to SnapArt as JPEGs. If you take a raw image and try to export it into SnapArt, it won't work. 
it just won't accept it. It'll tell you that it's the wrong file format. So you simply indicate JPEG here as your choice, okay? And that's easily done from within Lightroom. So the next thing you do is you take your image and I've selected this one. And by the way, all of the images that you're looking at as examples were taken within the last two weeks on my trip with the iPhone 14 Pro Max. I took my uh, Canon R6 and several lenses with me on the trip, hauled them on the ship and off the ship and brought them home. Never took a single image with my R6. All of the images, uh, over a thousand were taken with the, uh, the iPhone 14 Pro Max. Now this is in the uh, in a restaurant in the Fort Lauderdale airport. And this whole wall, which was probably like eight feet by 20 feet was filled with belt buckles. <laughs> and it's, we're seeing your screen, not uh, any photos. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's do this again and I'll stop the show. Thank you for telling me that. It does make one wonder. Okay. Okay, how about now? You seeing that uh, dollar sign belt buckle? No. 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 Nope. Oh. Okay. And we'll try a different one. Let's try this one. How about now? Yes. Good. Like Good job. Better. Okay, let's see if I can get a full screen here. There we go. There we go. So it's a belt buckle, uh, and this whole wall is filled with belt buckles. So I use the uh, macro feature on my iPhone 14 Pro Max and took some close-up shots. So I'm simply in Lightroom and I select this image and I right click as indicated here, right click and I come up with this interface and it says edit in. And now because I have SnapArt uh, installed as a plugin, it's available right here. It says edit in SnapArt 4. That's what I want. So I click on that. And it brings up a next screen. Uh, if you uh, if you shot as a roll, then uh, well, you get this option. You can create a copy with any adjustments you may have made in Lightroom. Or if you're shooting, uh, if you shot JPEG format, you could just overwrite the original. My recommendation is to make a copy, even even if you uh, shot as a JPEG. That way, when you do your work in SnapArt, you'll be able to compare that with the original and, and see how you, if you like the, the effect of SnapArt. So I would say I'll always make a copy. Okay. And if you're working in Lightroom and have made some adjustments, then you want the top one. Okay. Otherwise, you want the middle one uh, to make a copy of the, uh, the JPEG. All right. So you make a copy. And this is the interface that you get uh, that is uh, SnapArt. You can see the main image displayed here with an effect. Over here, we have uh, the uh, uh, different effects that you can apply in the panels. There's color pencil, comics, crayon, impasto, and you can see the, the list there, and I'll go over those a little bit later uh, to show you examples. And then you have presets. So you simply click on the different ones, abstract, colorful, default, or detailed, uh, and click on each one to see which one you like best. Then you can go to the panel on the right, and I'm not going to take the time, as Joe indicated, to go through all the options, but you have a whole list of variables that you can adjust with these sliders. And you do it just to taste. And what I usually do is just start at the top and I'll go back and forth and see, oh, do I like the, the effect of that one? And I go down through the list. And as you can see here, they're, they're in different categories. These sliders affect the background. These effects, there's one for uh, masking effects you can do uh, and affect the colors, the lighting, you know, so forth and so on. But anyway, once you pick the one that you want, uh, generally, and make the adjustments, then you bring it back into Lightroom. And here I'm showing the original on the left, which you saw previously. And this is the SnapArt uh, version with color pencil applied. Now, if you think the uh, effect is too strong, you know, you can, now you can't do much with it. You'd have to start over again, but you can take it, the original again now back into SnapArt and say, uh, once I, yeah, I looked at it, I thought that's a little too strong. And you can change the effect. You can lessen the effect or, or use those sliders on the right to make the changes that I, I showed you earlier. 
Uh, I'll talk in a minute about some other ways that you can modify uh, the final uh, look. These are our two waiters uh, while we were on the cruise. This is uh, Hector and Miguel. They're both from Mexico. They were great guys. And uh, Hector was a movie buff uh, with his fam famous, fa uh, favorite movie being The Godfather. So he was constantly uh, make, quoting uh, passages from The Godfather. And when I applied, went through that same process now with this photo, but now I used the comics option. And I went through the presets, picked one that I liked, made some minor adjustments with the sliders and output it, output it like, and it looked like this. So whether you like that effect or not, you just want something different. That's what comics basically looks like uh, with some alterations. Uh, this was in uh, one of our ports of call uh, Customaya, as you can see there. This is the original. Here I took it, and then I took it into SnapArt and applied a crayon effect, which looks like that. Nextly, uh, also in Customaya, this is the original, the flamingos, and these were live. And I came over, I used you know, Impasto and came up with this result. Now, you might look at that and say, well, it's a little too surrealistic for me. And, and you do lose detail. That's part of the process. Okay, that when you add these effects, you can look at the uh, feathers on the flamingo and here, you know, you don't get that kind of detail, but that's part of the effect. If you want more detail in just a specific area, like the flamingo's head, neck, and body, before you export it or before you, you save it from SnapArt, you can go in the, with a masking brush and you can decrease the intensity of the effect wherever you want. So you could bring back more detail you know, in the feathers. There's a way to do that in post that I'll, I'll explain in just a minute too. So I'm going down through each one of the categories that I showed you earlier. There's impasto, here's oil painting. This was another one of our cruise stops where my, my brother and his wife went kayaking and I just took pictures with my iPhone. This is the original of course, and with this, the oil painting effect. As I say, it takes a little bit of the reality out of it. Um, I think uh, Rick Salmon says sometimes, if you want a, a photograph to be noticed, take some of the reality out of it, make it look a little bit less documentary. Uh, one, of the, uh, well, one of the flowers out of the bouquet that I got my wife for our 52nd wedding anniversary, uh, this uh, bouquet of lilies, uh, the original, and then with the snap art pastel effect applied. Uh, this is the uh, pen and ink effect. Uh, it started raining uh, when we were in, uh, uh, where was that? One of the ports. And of course, folks going back, wrapped in their towels and going back to the ships. We were on the Sky Princess. And this is the other princess ship, the Enchanted. It was in the dock at the same time. But if you wanted to make it look a little different for some reason, this is how the pen and ink uh, application would appear. Then there's pencil sketch. Okay. This was in St. Martin, uh, this uh, last wooden uh, statue in the beach and simply applied the pencil sketch. Uh, this is from the deck of our ship on the 16th deck of the Sky Princess. This is a panorama that was done with my iPhone. This is the original. And here I applied a pointillism effect in SnapArt. And... This is kind of interesting. This is one of the musicians. The first week we were on board was with Concerts at Sea. It was bands from the 60s. So this is a, 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 a group that was playing the one night. And this is what the original look like, looks like. There was an electronic background you know, and a screen. And it looked very vibrant. So this is the original, which is vibrant to begin with. But I thought, ah, let's stylize it a little bit. So in SnapArt, I got it to look like this. Now, if you say, eh, I'm okay with the background, but I don't really like what it does to the guy, you know, it makes him look pretty, pretty funky. Well, you can, one of two things you can do. As I mentioned with the, the uh, Lily, you could, before you save it from SnapArt, you could go in and brush away the effect, okay? As I have done here. So I maintained the background with the, the funky effect from SnapArt but I used the brush to take the effect away, at least to some degree, from the guitarist. Okay. 
Now, the other thing you can do, which is pretty common with people who like these uh, uh, effects applied by plugins, if you're a little bit familiar with Photoshop, once you have the original and you have the snap art version, you can take them into Photoshop as layers of the same file. And then you can blend them in a much more sophisticated and subtle way. Okay, So you can either do the... Uh, do it, take away some of the effect in snap art before you save it, or you can do it by combining the two layers into one Photoshop file and taking it from there. Uh, another one of the lilies in that bouquet, the original, and this is a water color effect that was applied. And of course, you, you can still do your processing in Lightroom, you know, the dodging and burning if you want, brightening, darkening. Uh, you know, you can do all that kind of stuff to the original. And then if you decide more needs to be done, when the JPEG file is saved from SnapArt, you can do additional processing, you know, uh, back in Lightroom again. All right. And that's basically my part. And uh, there's contact information if you have any questions or need any more information about that. So uh, let me stop sh share. That will be part of the PDF. The part of the email that goes out tomorrow is the follow-up. It'll be a, P, a PDF, and uh, then Joe will have uh, another PDF that uh, addresses his part of the program. Uh, any questions uh, that I can uh, respond to? Yeah, Dennis, I noticed a lot of that uh, had, there was similarities with that and brushstroke. Yes, oh, thank you. Because one of the things I did, didn't mention, brushstroke is an app for your phone, right, Rod? Yes. Okay. This program is not applicable to mobile devices. There is no uh, app for your phone. This is strictly a, a desktop. Uh, don't even think iPad. It's a desktop app. But it can be used as a plug, uh, plug in or uh, as a standalone. And to address your question, Rod, yes, the effects it applies uh, are in many ways similar to the app that you mentioned called Brushstroke. So a lot of people who do this sort of thing on, on their phones will use different apps that, you know, brushstroke being one of those. There are many others that you can use uh, to apply painting effects also. All right, thanks. Sure, anything else? Dennis, I have a question. Whoops, can't hear whoever that was. That's me, Bruce. Okay, Bruce. Um, Dennis, when you are out and like on this trip, specifically using your iPhone, did you use your regular case or do you have a different case that you're putting on the iPhone to use? Oh, if, if you're, well, there are different cases, of course. No, I just have a simple uh, silicone, okay. silicone Apple case. And then when, uh, Bruce follows me and maybe referring to the infrared pictures that I took, which require a separate infrared filter. And I had to buy a separate adapter to put on the phone for that. But these effects that I've just shown you are done to straight collar photos that were done, you know, in this case with my iPhone, but could of course be done with your mirrorless or DSLR camera. Okay, cool. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis, have you purchased any other? Um snap-on lenses for your phone uh no i have not the the only one that i use is the infrared and uh if people who follow me on facebook have seen some of those results this is really interesting to me and if you're interested in finding out more about infrared photography uh with your iphone or with your phone camera i could do a presentation sometime uh but you can also uh send questions to me directly. My email address will be in the PDF and I can respond uh, to your questions uh, that way. Anything else on, uh, uh, oh, anything else on uh, SnapArt, I'm sorry. Okay, as I say, not everybody goes for those type of effects, but I sometimes tire of the documentary look. I want to spice them up sometime, somehow. And I've always admired being able to add painting effects. Well, I will tell you a little quick story. Uh, Julie Riker, some of you know as the painter, uh, a prolific painter in the area, and she exhibits at uh, Carlisle Arts Learning Center and other places. 
Well, a couple of years ago, uh, I was curious as to how she, as a, a true painter, would uh, respond to the effects of snap art. So I sent her some pictures, asked her to respond, and uh, she wasn't overly impressed as a painter. So, you know, it has a bit to be desired by people who are true painters and know the difference. But if you're just posting on Facebook or you're sharing with friends or you just want your images to look a little different, uh, I don't see any problem with, you know, with using a program like Snaplight. But, but don't pass it off as, as a true painter. It won't work. <laughs> okay, if there's nothing else, I'll turn it back to Joe. Okay, Dennis, um, can you guys see my uh, PDF up there for plugins? We yes. did. Oh. You do? And you can see me moving oh. it right now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this is a little present. And these are notes, basically, only because I have a, some technical things in here to an extent that you might want to have a notes of. Instead of you writing them down, you can just go through and get this PDF tomorrow and take a look at it if you're, if you're so inclined. But um, as Dennis mentioned, uh, any raw processor you have, a plug-in will generally extend the capability of your program like Lightroom on one. And that's what really plugins are. And there's probably 100 or 150 different plugins that you could get. And there's many different ways for you to access the plugins. And for this particular presentation demonstration, we're going to be using Lightroom as the base layer of the raw processor as opposed to like Photoshop or on one. But if you want to access your plugins from, let's say, on one, you would say send this particular plugin to Photoshop. Or if you're using Photoshop, you would send it to, for instance, to Nick software here on one, Skylum software, or in our case with my case rather, excuse me, with Lightroom, these are the plugins that I have that I use occasionally uh, for me. So this is how you access it. Just as Dennis showed that you would do right click, edit in, that's what will come up within your Lightroom. And you'll actually see that here as I go through it. So I just wanted to let you know that there's different ways to do it. Most of the time when you see this here, when you'd right click and let's say Lightroom and say edit in, you're gonna be editing the file that you have in your computer Lightroom and it's gonna be made into a TIFF. There is a way for you to be able to say uh, through plugin extras on Lightroom, you can export them and then there you will probably be able to use the raw file rather than having your image converted to a TIFF. But I'll show you that as we go through it. That, that would be real easy to see. And let me see here, uh, going the wrong way. There we go. So some of the plugins and the functionality that I, that I see like on one has really nice frames. I, I love the frames that they have there. Nick Software does a real good job on Orton, Luminar, Sky Replacement, Exposure, the Dennis showed you, SnapArt, Topaz, which is what I'm gonna be going, going through tonight, uh, has really good noise reduction and um, sharpening uh, effects. Silver Effects Pro, Pro has black and white and the list goes on and on and on. Okay, the downsides of using plugins is it can be expensive and you really wanna be able to use their trials before you actually sign up and pay the money for them because they can be, as Dennis gave you some prices and on the Topaz line, they can be 150 to $200 for some of these. So you really need to use them. Uh, you need to, to make sure you wanna use them before you start uh, plug, uh, buying them, in my opinion anyways, because they are expensive. So this evening, um, we're going to do Topaz uh, AI, SnapArt, which we've already done, and we're going to do Smart Photo Editor. So there's a couple things to be aware of. When you do a, a, a plugin, it may, depends on the, the firm that made the software, it may change your raw file into a TIFF, okay? And when you do that, and I'm not gonna go through these, but these things here may get changed 
in your file. And I'll actually show you that when we go through here so you can see it. But I have them listed here so you would be able to know that if you aren't able to change the white balance by the normal things that you use after it's come back, your image from a plugin and those normal settings for like tungsten daylight are missing. There's a reason for that. And I'm gonna show you that. But these functions that I have here are things that may be lost when you bring an image back from a plugin. And it's really easy to overcome them by right here. And that is you just make those changes before you send it in to the plugin. And I'll go through, I'll show you that. And okay, so we're gonna get into it. And uh, if you have any questions on this, uh, I'm gonna suggest that you use Google and get some instruction videos, which are absolutely phenomenal. There's a gazillion of them out there for most of the major plugins. And if you have gen general questions, you can ask and talk to Dennis and I. So I'm going to be bringing up Lightroom. Can you see my Lightroom screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay great. So um, most of these images you see here are um, from my recent trip to Vietnam. But I, and so I'm going to show you real life situations that, and why I've used um, the pr programs for the, that we're working with here. So first of all, let me get this. I am using, uh, I'm going to be using the program called, oh, where to go? Um, the po Topaz Photo. Topaz has in the past, and they still do, they have a denoise, a sharpening, and they have a gigapixel. And all three of those that they are now combining into a single program called Topaz Photo. It combines all three of them together. And, uh, and I use that one. And it's still relatively new. It's only been out for like two or three months. And they will give you an update about every four or five days. They will be adding features and fixing bugs. But I'm using that for all of these images you're going to see here. So all of these are in Vietnam, except this one right here. And this one is a raw file. And this raw file um, came from Africa. And if I go and show you the settings for that, you can see that the ISO was 32,000 and the shutter speed was 1 15th of a second at f5.6. So you can tell I didn't have much light, OK? And I thought, oh, I kind of like the image. And I, but you know what? It has an awful lot of noise in it. Look at this here. And I think this is worthwhile just taking a second to look at what is the noise in, in an image. And if I come down here to the detail panel, and that's where noise reduction in Lightroom is located, you can see they have a slider for luminance and for color noise. If you can see all of these little red speckles in here. Can you see all that? That's called color noise. And that is real easy to get rid of. And that just like that, I can get rid of that color noise. That's real, real easy. The difficult noise is what they call the luminance noise. And I can get rid of it, but it makes it look very plasticky. Okay. And so these are the two functions that you have built in to most programs that have noise reduction will have these two functions, luminance noise and color noise. And when I have a noisy image like this, I will not use these. I will not make any changes to these because I'm going to use a plugin and I'm going to use uh, Topaz. Um, photo. So what I will do is I will right click on it and I'm going to edit it in to Topaz Photo AI. And I'm going to do edit with Lightroom adjustments. Okay. So that's going to bring up the program here. It's preparing the file for editing. 
and Topaz AI has come up, but it's given me a notice in saying that we notice that you are not using our raw plugin. And they're right, I'm not using the raw plugin. I'm using the, the conversion from my uh, Lightroom into Topaz via a TIFF. Right here, you can see the file name, the TIFF right in here. I'm doing that for the sake of convenience is why I'm doing it. And it'll, it'll be more, less confusing. So I'm gonna take that note, ignore it, and just continue how I really thought we should do it. And that is on the uh, TIFF. So what happened was in doing this, this program recognized that there was a subject, but it missed it. It recognized that there was a subject. It recognized by itself that it was a high, uh, had a lot of noise in it. It didn't think I needed to sharpen it. It didn't, it didn't think that. It didn't think I needed to enhance the resolution. It didn't think that. It thought, and this is where the, the artificial intelligence comes in, that the, um, the software recognizes a definable subjects because you would want to affect the noise reduction differently or in the sharpening differently from the background and from the main subject. And so it actually, it, it figures that out. And if I fit this in, it says, this is where I need to have my noise reduction. If you notice that when I move my mouse, uh, go into 100% here for a second. If I take my mouse and I push down, this is the original, and this is what Topaz did, okay? I think I need to do a little bit, and it did it all automatically. I didn't do anything because it's smart. So I think it needs a little bit of sharpening. And I think that when I do my sharpening, I have different models. I can use the standard one, a lens blur, a motion blur, which I will, you'll see that in the, in the next Im image. But I just, this is the sharpening now that I'm in. The first one took care of the noise right in here. And now the sharpening is something I'm gonna do and I'm gonna increase the strength of my sharpening. And you'll notice that when I do that, this little progress bar down here has to update and it'll go back. And every time it wants to do a preview, it has to take these settings that I'm using and it has to update them. And that's what it's done. I kind of detect I have some motion blur there. So I may want to change my model to motion blur. And I can't really see much difference. But what I did on here now, I brought the image in and it, suggest, it selected the subject. It said it took, and took out the high noise and it sharpened it because I wanted it sharpened. So on that image, I'm done. I'm gonna take it back to, a, to Lightroom. I have a uh, MacBook, what I'm using right now, and it's a pretty fast machine. And um, so um, it does a, I'm gonna move this over here. Oh, I can't do that. Okay, so this is my original file. And this is the one that I just was working on. And I'm gonna to go to the library and I'm gonna compare those. Okay, this is my original. And this is my sharpened file right here, my Topaz file. And this is what it has done on an image that is very noisy and had lots of motion. I'm gonna show you different ones here because there's many different versions I have. Depends on how much I move my sliders. Here I have it, and as this particular one, I move my sliders more, spent more time on them. And so therefore I got a better result. And this is what I had to start with at 32,000. And this is what Topaz has done for me to make what I would consider to be a least a reasonable photo for something that was shot at 1 15th of a second at 32,000 uh, ISO. This is probably one reason why the Topaz product has been the most popular 
noise reduction uh, out there um, is because of the, that's all they do right now, basically, is do noise reduction and sharpening and the what they call upsizing. So that is what we have right there. I'm gonna show you another one here or two. And um, I want to get this one here, I'm gonna do like that, okay. This one here, ISO of 320, one tenth of a second. Now, when I was in Vietnam, I, I spent an awful lot of time doing panning. So I would get effects like this with the blurring in the background, but having my subjects somewhat sharp, okay? And that was what I tried to do. So if I come in here and I can see that, I, I kind of got there, but you can see my motion blur, right? I see this right in here and round right in here and up in his hair and this guy over here, he has a lot of motion blur and I wanted to get that out. So what I did was I went again and I right clicked, I edit in, to Topaz Photo AI, and I'm editing a copy, and it's cooking right now. It's taken into Photo AI, and now I'm not gonna show this again because I'm getting tired of looking at it. So here I have the image. So what it detected was it detected the subject, okay? And if I click this right here, it tells me the subjects that it detected, and it did that automatically. And when it detected it, it needed to also looked at the faces and it needed to do some sharpening for the out of focus, uh, what they considered to be the out of focus uh, parts of the image. So if I come over here, this was what it was before. And now after they made those few adjustments, this is what they did. Let me go in a little bit. Um, let's go into maybe 200%, okay. This was before and this is after. I, however, know that I have an awful lot of motion blur in here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the model to motion blur. Well, it was there. I thought it wasn't. And I'm gonna take the strength of that up, okay? Now it's gonna give me a new preview and it's sharpening him. And you can look in here now and it's taken away some of that motion blur that I have. But yet what it's doing is it's keeping the, the, the original blur. It hasn't affected this at all because it suggests it selected the subjects, but ignored the background, which is exactly what I wanted and gave me a sharper image. Let's see what he did with the other guy over here. Now here, this was the way before and this is after. So I think that did a pretty darn good job. I'm gonna save it back. It's processing it now. It takes a while. It's, it's, a, it's a very high processor usage application. And this is my before, oh, excuse me, that's not my before and after. This one is my, where is it here? Where is my before? No, nope. right here. That's my before, and this is my after. I'm going to do this side by side, and you can see the difference is what I've done. Is I have this is the original, and this is the the one that had most inverter, very aggressive. Okay, this one here is. Oh, I wanted to show you that one and compare it to the original side by side. Let's come in here. And here is my original. And that was this model that I used. And this is the NEF. And I used this model. Oh, come on. Well, I'll just take, I'll take them individually. It's easier to see. So I did this one, let me get uh, one on one, okay. Sharpening, sharpening. And this is the best model that I used. I used different models that they had there to be able to give me this image here out of that image there. And, I, and that did a really good job in my mind 
in terms of the motion blur. Okay, so let's go through and let's go through some others. Let's take um, this one here. Right here and right here. And let's do a side by side. This is the original image at 25,600 at 1 350th of a second. And I did that because this little girl was jumping around like, like a bunny. And I had to make sure I got her sharp, but yet I had to use a super high ISO 25,000. And I took it into Topaz Photo AI and I got that. Now, you're gonna say that has a lot of plasticky look in her face and you're right. First of all, she is a young kid and so the face was kind of smooth, but yeah, that is one of the problems that you can have when you do a lot of sharpening to really high ISO images. You can get that sort of a plastic look, but I think it did keep the flavor of the other parts of the image correctly, but it did do a, a, a little bit of um, extra sharpening, excuse me, smoothing on her face. But considering that this is what, this is what I started with, okay? And uh, where'd you go, right here, right here. This is what I started with, and I ended up with that. I was pretty darn happy with it, uh, that I had a usable image. And this was all done with that program, the um, uh, photo, Topaz Photo AI. I'm gonna do another comparison for you here. This is 12,800. This was in a village where there was hardly, we were in people's homes, like this one here, we're in this lady's house. And there was an, uh, I had a photography guy that I hired for a day and he took me to these locations and he didn't know these people. So we would go and we hear them were making uh, rice uh, paper, okay? And they use the rice paper to they dry it and they use it to be able to make like um, uh, uh, souffles and things like that. They'll wrap things in them, uh, food items. So they're making these in their little, in their house. And so we don't have hardly any light whatsoever. And, and she's taking this thing and she's, moving it around and very quickly. And so I had to have that kind of a shutter speed and I had to get a 12,800. And this is what I've been able to do with uh, Topaz Photo AI for, and with what Night, Lightroom would do. I'm gonna show you a couple more. I want a, a couple more here, and then I'm gonna go to another program. Okay, this one here, this is uh, 51,000. <laughs> I mean, I could hardly see in there. And I don't know how in the heck that guy ever ran that sander over the wood because it was so darn dark. Uh, but he was moving his hands quite quickly. So I, again, had to use a faster shutter speed. I used some slower shutter speeds, but it was too much. Uh, it was too much because his whole body was moving. So I, it was totally blurry. It wasn't like just his hands were moving. So I took it into Topaz and I converted it to black and white. Now, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, I'm not happy with that and I would never put it into a, a contest, but I went from that, I went from that to that. And if you look in the detail, I, I think it came out pretty darn good. So those are the um, things that you want to, uh, that I use in terms of, um, in, in Topaz, well, I, I wanna show you something now that's important. And let me take you on this one here, this image here. I want you to see something. Over here, I have the basic and see where it says camera standard. This is a profile. And this is my camera has these profiles built in. This is what they have built in. And I can, in the raw files, I have complete access to these. These are all built into my camera. And sometimes I'll use a standard, sometimes I'll use a vivid. And, but if I look at this image here and I go to my profiles, I've lost all of my camera profiles. I know I have the Adobe profiles, but I don't have my camera 
profiles. You have a lots of others, but if you depend on your camera profiles, like let's say if you're out shooting and uh, you want to do things in black and white, but yet you still want to have the color, you might change your uh, profile in your camera to black and white, to monochrome. So you can see what it's going to look like in black and white. If it, came, if it comes back, the raw file will honor that coming into the, your Lightroom program. But if you take it to a plugin, it'll lose that. And it'll lose a couple of other things. For instance, right here, if I look at my white balance, I have all of my camera white balances here. But if I look at the one that's been processed in Topaz or any, um, any uh, plugin generally, you lose that. You don't have that available. And if I look down here in lens corrections, I can remove chromatic aberration. And on my raw file, I can apply my, my lens correction. If I look at this one, enable lens correction, it says it's not available. It loses that. And that's true almost all plugins that those things will sort of go away because those are camera specific things. And the, the solution to it is, is basically to make those adjustments prior to going into the Topaz product or whatever product you're gonna use. So I'm now just gonna show you another couple uh, images side by side. And so you can get a little bit of an idea of what we're faced with in terms of noise and here. So, so this is the Topaz product. Any questions on that? Good, Joe, Rich Scar. Um, just yeah. one thing is when that message came up on, on your screen, I think it's an important one I've found um, because if you're working in RAW in Lightroom, mm -hmm. once you go into the way that you proceeded there, it converts it to a TIFF or a JPEG, which you bring back into Lightroom. So then you're editing a JPEG. I, I, what I've done is if you go back and do the other go up to Lightroom and, and, and go right into the RAW, then you can use Topaz in RAW, it goes back into Lightroom in RAW, and then you can do your editing and then export as a JPEG. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And that's exactly what you can do. And it generally, I mean, you, you would be silly to take it from a RAW to a JPEG, but taking it to a TIFF is pretty high quality. And I have done a lot of testing on this because I was working on a couple thousand images and I was using this pretty heavy and I couldn't see a real significant uh, difference to it. Mm -hmm. And so I went with the TIFF because it speeded up my workflow quite a bit, uh, but yes, that's true. And another thing, if you're gonna be doing this is that when you're gonna take into any software that's going to do sharpening or noise reduction, you want to make sure that you have your sharpening turned off and you have your noise reduction turned off. You want to have them turned off. You don't want Lightroom to do it and then give it to a program like on one for noise reduction and have it try and do it on top of what Lightroom does. You don't want to do that. What you do want to do too is you don't want to use any of the clarity, the dehaze, or texture. Putting texture into an image before you take it to the, to the noise reduction software, it'll think that that texture is really noise. When it's not, you added it. So you want to do those things after you bring it back in, not before you take it in. So any questions? Joe Dick Messner here. With all these plugins, is it still true that your original file is not touched, not changed? As long as you're using RAW, like in this particular case here, that file has never been touched or changed whatsoever. It's making a derivative of it. And that's why the, it has a TIFF. And that's why if you look over here, all those things that was that uh, Rhino, I did all those, and every one of them was an iteration of a new file. Now those are a lot; those are big files, okay? So you want to get rid of them. But yes, your raw file will not get uh, touched in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, Joe. I, I sound like a salesman for Topaz, but one other thing about Topaz that I've really liked is 
being able to send multiple images to Topaz and then going to them in time. I, I said 17 of them this afternoon, for example, that I could go through. And you don't have to preview them if you don't want to. If you feel like you, after a while you trust Topaz, you can is just- Is that easy to do? It'll go, it'll go into processing. It is, is that easy? It is extremely easy to do, to take a whole batch of them. And the reason why, uh, Richard, I really appreciate you saying that because the reason why it works so well is because Topaz, the AI, artificial intelligence, analyzes each scene. For instance, it'll analyze this girl and this dog, and it'll say, I need to do sharpening one way for him, them, but it knows I do not want to sharpen the backgrounds, okay? And that's why I have it set up to do that. Do not sharpen the backgrounds because I want to have these guys be the sharpness in it. And it figures that out because you think of in Lightroom, if I were to take um, this image or, um, right here, and if I was going to, let me get the raw file of that. Where is it here? Oh, that's, that's, that's a raw file. If I was going to sharpen that and do noise reduction in Lightroom, what would I do? I would come down to detail and I would take noise reduction and I would apply it to the whole image like that. And everything in that image is getting exactly the same amount of noise reduction. <laughs> it's not differentiating between these people, right? Here, the dog and, and the little girl. It's not doing that. Whereas in Topaz, it's recognizing, I said, recognize people and subjects. I said, do that. So this is going to be uh, giving preference for noise reduction and sharpening. And he will hear the dog, but the background will not. It'll get the noise reduction, but it won't get the sharpening. It knows that. And that's why you can take a whole batch of images and plug them in like wedding photographers. You know, they come back from a wedding and they have a thousand images. They plug them into Topaz. I mean, they do their basic edits first in Lightroom, then they, or whatever program they're using, and then they throw them into the batch process and it'll just sit there and crunch for 10, 15 minutes and they come back and they get basically what we have here um, as the final product. Okay, that's what they have. And then they can go in if they say, no, that didn't really do it the way I wanted. And then they still have the raw file, then they can go in and, and change it themselves. Joe, in the new Lightroom, uh, under masking, you can pick subjects, you can pick the person, so on and so forth. Right. So the sharp, if you did that and use Lightroom sharpening, is that better or not as good as what Topaz would do? It is definitely not as good because I have um, I become a student of using the um, the masking tools uh, within Lightroom and doing my sharpening and noise reduction and they can't hold a candle to Topaz. I mean um, I'm a I, I I just blown away that I actually can generate an image like that and if all the tricks that I know of in Lightroom I could never take and get and get that quality that I had right here. Joe, comment about uh, how hard Topaz engineers are working to improve this, this product. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> interesting, Dennis. Um, in the last week or so, I was getting ready for this and I wanted to get some of these images and stuff. And during the past two weeks, I had three updates. <laughs> <laughs> three updates. They are working day and night to enhance it. And what they're enhancing is how they detect what a, what a person is, okay? Like sometimes in the beginning, they might drop a hand, but now, they're, now they've gotten the hand in there, okay? Because they figured that out through their algorithms. They originally would do some sharpening in really crazy areas. Like they might put a big sharpen thing in here and it didn't make any sense. And so they've, they've been making those improvements. Now it is a subscription model. You can buy it one time, and, but you don't get any of those updates after like a year. If you wanna continue to get the updates, then you have to, to get a subscription model to do that. And I can understand that. This is a key piece of software for many people, a key piece. Okay, so we have- Hey, Joe. Yeah. Yo, Don Uvic, uh, just curious. Um, I'm working with a lot of images uh, <clears throat> from my family from the 40s and the 50s right now. 
Um, some of them are negatives I can might be able to scan and others aren't. Have you tried anything along those lines to see? Because I know a lot of those shots that I had uh, that were taken by relatives way back when uh, were not very sharp and, uh, you know, it would take yeah. a lot of work to, to get some of the blur out of some of that. Have, have, has anybody tried to use yeah. Topaz? Because I'm, I'm a relatively new user. Okay, so I, I do some work uh, for Pure Gallery. It's an art gallery here in Mechanicsburg. And uh, whenever they get a, a, a damaged print in or one that's been like set, set in, in the sun for like six years, uh, they'll send it, to, they'll I'll go pick it up and I'll work on it. I did just did one recently and it was absolutely horrid. And I figured there's no way that I can be able to to retreat uh, that could restore this one. It's still going to look bad. Well, I took it in, took it into Pope Topaz Photo, and it made a really significant difference. But I had to use the masking tools in there because it misconstrued what some things were. They thought some things were people when they weren't, and because the quality of the image was so bad. But I did clean up on it, and it came out pretty good. So that okay. was my only use of it. I don't know how it would work with negatives or anything like that. Yeah, Joe, okay. I've done, this, I've done the same you. thing, Joe, on, on older pictures, whatever. And it's amazing when you go through it, well, you'll say, oh, now I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's and the, the client of the, the Prior Gallery said exactly the same thing. Well, who is that? Oh, I see. OK, yeah. So yeah, yeah, Don, I can add a comment to that. Uh, I've been scanning some pictures that are about well, around 60 years old. You know, when I was two, three, four, five years old type of thing. And uh, well, no, they're older than that. Uh, it does an amazing job in some regards. What I had to be careful of was it will detect the faces and uh, yeah, does an amazing job of almost reconstructing the faces to the effect that they stand out glaringly from the background. And I've had to decrease the effect through the program on the faces. You know, just it's, it's like an opacity slider just to get it to blend in more with the overall look of the pictures. But all in all, I, I think it's done an amazing job if you don't let it go wild. Great, thank you. I'm gonna move on to another editor. Uh, This is a smart photo editor. And this one is uh, Judy Keim, out, a member of ours out in Breckenridge, uses this extensively because Mike Motes, who is the workshop leader, instructor, and macro photographer, uses this program. And rather than going through the program, I'm gonna show you some selected images that she has worked with and has modified using Smart Photo Editor. Smart Photo Editor is $29 and you can get a trial version, which is what I'm using here is a trial version. And um, because I don't think it's gonna fit into my workflow, but it, it is a trial version and it's $29 if you wanna buy it. But here's what she bought it for and what she uses it for. These were some um, cranes I think those are cranes, aren't they? Birders? Those are cranes, right? I think so. Yes, they're they are. They look like sand hill cranes, I think. Sand hill cranes, okay. So this is the image she took with her, her Canon camera, right here, the CR3, which is a raw file. She cropped it and she converts them to JPEGs as she goes on her process. So you don't have to do that. It could be a TIFF or whatever. And then she added the border and a texture to it. And, she, and that looks really kind of cool. And she is very artistic that way. I have to show you something that just blew me away. She took this picture of a butterfly. I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I may have put that in, in the garbage can. I don't know for myself anyways. But she took it and she cropped it. And then she took it into Smart Photo Editor. And that's what she did. I mean, that's, I think that is really, really cool. She did another one, which is, I think is absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning is this one right here. And she was walking along and it was a part of a plant and whatever it felt, it came off and she took a photograph of it. She then took it into smart photo editor 
and she came up with that. She came up with the background and with the um, border. Smart Photo Editor, I'll show you this briefly, is, um, let me, uh, th this is the cranes that she had, okay? And so what happened, let me go to, uh, let me just say uh, cancel, okay? She'll take that image and she'll go to the effects gallery. Now, this is really interesting. You see where it has all contributors? All the things that you see have been contributed by people to this. And these are the effects. And she'll go through here and she'll pick one that she really likes. Or she might say, I don't want to do anything. I just want to put a border on it. And she'll pick a border like that. And it makes the image. That's how easy it is, just like that. It's, it's amazing how fast and easy it is. Now it is an older program and it has, a, it's a little clunky, um, but it, for 29 bucks, I'm gonna probably buy it just for the borders myself. And um, Judy, Judy uses this for all of her work. And uh, let me just take it back to some of the other ones that she has, just to give you an idea. Like this one here is one where she uh, took the photo she cropped it and then she added a border to it. Here, here, this is one where she, um, the, the image here, she cropped it and then she put a border and she put a texture layer on it. And she is very similar to me in the sense that she's clueless on a lot of the, of the Photoshop stuff. And so she can make this actually work. This is where I think her gallery is, or excuse me, her, her shop is in Breckenridge. She took that image. This is a, a JPEG, excuse me, a raw file from her Canon camera. And then she straightened it. And then she put a border and a texture layer on it. She, and this is a, a rather obscure program. I don't know too many people that use this one, but it is so reasonably priced and it gets you into this realm pretty easily. So she did this with the, with the bison, she cropped it, and then she put a border on it. And then she did a little bit of vignetting on it and a softening effect. You can see here where it did like the painterly soft effect to it. And she did that by coming into her program and going to the effects gallery and looking like for artistic things, and, and picking one of them like this is an example, 29 bucks. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. And she puts all of her signatures in here too. So that was a real brief by Dennis and I on uh, the rule of plugins. Uh, and any questions? Oh, <clears throat> pardon me, just a comment, but Judy would have presented herself, but she's traveling tonight and wasn't able to attend the meeting live. Right. Thank you, Dennis. I forgot to say so that. We, we thank Judy for allowing us to uh, use her, her photos. Yeah. And for telling us about the uh, smart photo editor. Mm -hmm. uh, it does in some ways remind me of On One, yeah, another plugin in the interface and the way it operates and what you can do. On one I've been using for many, many years, almost as long, well, as long as, as SnapArt, I've been using put, to put borders around my images and add texture layers. Mike, uh, do you want to have any comments about On One for that purpose? Uh, yeah, On One is, um, they have gobs of textures. And sorry, Mark Albana, lots of presets. They, um, also have a lot of borders it's kind of like they're they're trying to be all things to all people and they're pretty successful at it so yeah you're right dennis there's a ton of borders and a ton of um textures that you can put and the masking is is really really good now so you can put the the texture really anywhere you want yeah, one and thing i mike from what i interrupt you there dennis excuse me but mike what i've heard was that on one's noise reduction is on a very close par to what Topaz has. Okay, that's what I'm hearing. Now I don't know if they have the um, 
artificial intelligence to automatically know this is a background, don't sharpen it, this is the person, sharpen it, and that kind of a thing. But I hear it's very, very good quality. It's a, I think it's two years old now, and it's um, artificial intelligence, it's AI. Okay. And you can sharpen or do noise reduction, and it is really, really good. And when you go to to apply, the, let's use that in particular, the box will come up and there will be a little list of things that populate your photograph. So it might have, if you took a picture of a meal, there will be one of the choices to mask will say food. Or if it's your dog, one of the choices will be animal. So it actually, <laughs> The hmm. AI reads what's in the photograph and gives you choices of what to mask and what not to. That is amazing, isn't it? To actually yeah. figure that out. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Yeah. It really is. It really. Oh my gosh. Hey, Joe, the uh, Rich Carr again. The I'm by no means an expert on this, but it, it, the AI, what Topaz and the other program that Mike mentioned, whatever you know, is is based to a great extent on crowdsourcing. You know, in terms of running millions and millions of photos through. And when you saw the thing on what Judy showed about people contributing, what, what Topaz does is that they say, it says, if this is not working for you, please send us your photos, whatever. Mm -hmm. because they, and they, they just run that through. It's part of the AI model. So right. essentially, it's not just smart people sitting down and trying to figure out how to fix something. Essentially, everybody's crowdsourcing this, whatever. So no wonder they send out so many updates. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, let me uh, offer a, a, a minor word of caution. Many of these programs uh, duplicate a lot of the work that you want to do. So before, and each one has its own learning curve. So before you go out and spend money on this program and that program, because they look interesting and they might do this and that, investigate to see what you're getting into. Because I have been guilty of this myself. I have purchased a number of these programs, used them for a little bit, and then find that they sit on my computer and, and I don't go back to them because there are several, like I'll, Lightroom's my base. And then I use some plugins, but then there are other ones I purchased that I never go back to. So I would, you know, there's no sense paying for programs that are going to sit on your computer that you never use. But some of them out there are certainly worthy of your consideration. Topaz Photo A by being one of them. And I, I'll second that, Dennis, about getting trials and just trying it. And don't try it for two or three times. Do it for like a week or two and use it a couple of times yeah. because then all of a sudden the euphoria of this being a great program might start to slip on you a little bit because you might sense that like, for instance, in here, this is maybe a little bit too sharp as an example. I'm just making this up now. And then you'll start picking at it. And, and that's really good. Uh, yes. Well, and the other thing the programs of the engineers have done, they've, they've tried to, to make each program uh, an, do everything. I started years ago with On One because it did frames and it didn't do a whole lot else. Then when raw editors came along, well, the you know, On One said, well, we've got to be able to process raw images. So they took over the raw imaging and all this other stuff that, that Lightroom, you know, and, and program, the Lightroom program does. And then Luminar. Well, I thought, hey, Luminar was great. That had sky replacement. And, <laughs> but then it became a raw editor too. And the next thing you know, Lightroom and Photoshop have sky replacements that's just as good or, or even better. So they're all competing to keep up with each other. So use some discretion in, in what you decide to, to go with because it does take time and money. And you know what? We benefit from that too, from all that competition. Yeah, um, indeed. We do. Joe, okay. what was the name of Judy's again? Oh, Smart Photo Editor right here. Smart Photo Editor. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I had never heard of it before Judy told me about it. Yeah. But I, I follow her on Facebook. And like Joe showed you the examples there, she's constantly putting up beautiful images like that that she created from not much, like the butterfly image. Yeah. Just fantastic with beautiful borders and the textures and the colors, and they look very artistic. Yeah, she does a great job. Yeah. 
deviating from that document documentary approach that that uh, I talked about, you know, becoming uh, less re less real. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's um, eight twenty. Any other questions? Very good job, gentlemen. Well, thank you, guys. We appreciate good it. Job well done. Thank okay. you. Thank you. You're going to get a PDF tomorrow with those notes that I had and uh, with Dennis's uh, presentation. And um, and if you can think of other things that you think we might do, uh, let us know. Like, for instance, this was a suggestion to do the plugins, and we followed through. Um, if you think we should maybe have uh, members show their raw processor as an example, we could do that, or I, or any other aspect of it. Uh, <clears throat> send us a note with any ideas that you may have that you would like to see us do. That would be that would think that would be very helpful for us. Yeah, if you've never tried te adding texture layers and uh, digital frames, of course you can do it in Photoshop. But with these plugins, it's much simpler. Uh, that would be something we could do too—a whole session on texture layers and and fra uh, digital frames. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we're um, ready to um, stop our meeting. And thank you much. Okay. Thank good you. night, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Dennis. Good night. You're welcome. Okay, recording. Yeah, good. Stop. That we we had one point forty seven people. Yeah.